The ancient witness today is from John 3, verses 14 through 21, and note that this is from the First Nations Version. Do you not remember when Moses, drawn from the water, lifted up a pole with a snake on it in the desert wilderness? This is what will happen to the true human being. So people will put their trust in him and have the life of the world to come that never fades away, full of beauty and harmony. The Great Spirit loves this world of human beings so deeply that Creator gave us his Son, the only Son who fully represents God. All who trust in him and his way will not come to a bad end, but will have the life of the world to come that never fades away, full of beauty and harmony. Creator did not send the Son of Man to decide against the people of this world, but to set them free from the worthless ways of the world. The ones who trust in the Christ are released from guilt, but for the ones who turn away from the Christ to follow the ways of this world, their guilt remains. This is because they are turning away from the life of beauty and harmony that the Great Spirit offers through Jesus. This is what decides for or against them. My light has shined into this dark world, but because of their worthless ways, people love the dark path more than the light. When they choose the dark path, they do not want others to see, so they hide in the darkness and hate the light. But the ones who are true and do what is right are walking with Creator. As I, as I said, we're going to, this whole Lent, Lenten journey thing that, that we do, these six weeks, are all, every, every year we come around to it, and it's all about, narratively speaking, moving with the story as Jesus uh, turns his attention toward Jerusalem, knowing that there will be... Uh, some bad things happening. He, he's aware that the cross awaits. And so, every, we got three crosses plus the big one there. So lots of crosses. When you, I was, I was gonna do a quick word association, one word. When you think of the cross, give me a word that goes with it. Suffering. Suffering. Redemption. What? Redemption. Redemption. Salvation. Those are all good ones. Rebirth. What's that? Rebirth. 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 Humanity. Humanity. Betrayal. Betrayal. There's, I'm, I know there's, there's a whole bunch of other words that would go with this symbol. And so I want to try maybe to unpack um, essentially what are the three classic ways of understanding the cross or theologizing on the cross. And we see it reflected in our hymns. And that's why I chose, we chose as a worship committee to try to feature three hymns that would reflect that, those three strains of understanding what the cross is about. The first one uh, we just sang. And uh, there's a couple of preliminaries I want to say. One is the cross is the main symbol of the Christian faith, but it didn't really, as my, from my research, does not really show up a whole lot in early primitive Christianity. Uh, the more uh, common symbols of the first, second generation church were like, we've all seen them on cars, right? The fish symbol. That was one of the early symbols. Uh, it was a code, a, a acronym uh, for the, for Stan, uh, Ictus, uh, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. The other one is the Cairo, which is, it, the, these are two Greek words, first two letters for Christ. And it, you've seen it, the P, 
and then the X below it. And that's the Cairo, again, a symbol or a sign for the first two letters, K, K, I guess, Christ. So uh, also symbols of vines, as Jesus being the true vine, or lamb of God, uh, lamb, uh, the lamb, or shepherd holding a lamb. Um, there were all kinds of early church symbols in the first, second generation of the church. But the cross really became the dominant symbol of the faith by the third, fourth century, as Constantine came to power. And Constantine actually, uh, at the same time, uh, outlawed the use of crucifixion. So it's an interesting uh, coming together there. Um, so we can't really talk about the cross without also mentioning the word atonement or redemption. So within the context of the Christian faith, this simply means how is this symbol of the cross or the reality of the cross serve to make right between us, presumably surely flawed human beings as we are, with God who is utterly beyond us and pure and righteous. How does the cross bridge this divide? How does the cross, to use religious language, redeem us? How does it make us whole? So let's start with the first one. This is called the substitution, uh, substitution understanding of the cross. Um, it was systematized, at, theologically speaking, not till about the 1100s by um, a, uh, a lawyer, actually, uh, uh, from the Middle Ages, a monk and a lawyer. Um, this is the idea, that was An Anselm was his name. Um, so it kind of has a, a, uh, a legal undertones to it. Justice, somebody has to pay the price. This first theory of atonement uh, is the idea that Jesus took the punishment, took the blow, if you will, from God, which you and I rightfully deserved. Some of the earliest theologies of this view suggested that Jesus paid the ransom through suffering. So you sometimes hear in our hymns ransom language in exchange for our freedom from punishment. Jesus paid the price for our sins on the cross, and by doing so, Jesus absorbed the Father's wrath towards us. Jesus took the required punishment on our behalf. He was the substitute, the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, pure, unblemished, sinless, and that's how Jesus saves. That's, that's a very common one. That's probably the pre prevalent, uh, particularly in... in our evangelical circles particularly. In 1 Peter 2, 4, it's reflected where, where uh, it says, he himself bore our sins in our body on the cross so that free from sin, we might live by righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. Or in Romans 3, 23 to 25, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. Okay, so that's the first one, the substitution. And there's a lot of problems with this, if we think about it. But there's also good things. So on all these, these three theories of of atonement, I'm going to say what is problematic about them and what is, is helpful about them, okay? The problems with this are the question, why would a loving God require anyone, let alone his only begotten son, to suffer on a Roman cross as a means of nullifying our sins? Doesn't this kind of make God seem a little violent or vengeful? Does God really need this kind of sacrifice in order that we can be saved? And if we say that God requires blood sacrifice, are we saying that God desires violence in order to love us? 
It's a transactional understanding of faith. It can be seen that way. That might seem a bit anthropocentric. It's also kind of uh, a magical thinking. Just by being washed in the blood of the lamb, so to speak, instantly makes everything all right. Psychologically, though we don't see it, may not see it overtly this way, but if God is indeed so needing someone to pay the price for our sins through suffering and death, then that means God, again, suggests that God has a, a, maybe a petty and cruel streak. And if God is cruel and petty, then we can be cruel and petty. A vengeful God models vengeance to the children of God. In other words, I believe that this view of the blood sacrifices somewhat messes with our heads a bit and may even explain why Christians have been so violent over the past uh, 2,000 years. After all, if God's understanding of justice is one whereby justice is served through violent sacrifice, it seems reasonable that we in turn would take that same understanding of justice and apply it to our own lives. Now, don't worry, I'm going to get to the positive of this. It assumes that we have an inherently fallen nature that can magically be fixed by this one act of sacrifice. And finally, it calls into question the perplexing notion of Christ as divine versus human. How do we understand this morning's scripture, for instance? For God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten son. So is it God on the cross? Or is it God's son on the cross? Or, I mean, it, it challenges our, and, and the church has been wrestling with from day one. How is Jesus divine and how is Jesus human? So it, it does raise those questions. Now, the good news of this view of salvation, if we blur, blur the distinctions and say that Jesus is in fact God incarnate, then God in Christ is demonstrating to us the full extent to which God's, God loves us even to go so far as to suffer and die on a cross on our behalf. That kind of sacrificial love is profound. And it wouldn't even, I would even say it's beautiful. And by extension, we too are called to this ultimate kind of sacrificial love for another, for one another. No greater love has someone to die than to die for another, as Jesus taught. Another good thing about this understanding of salvation from and the cross from a pastoral and personal perspective this can be this is a very powerful message for someone myself included afflicted with a, a, a intimate knowledge of my own guilt my own shame my own falling short and wondering if i'm okay with god and we all have some of that christ died for your sins is the message as far as the east is from the west, so are your sins in the eyes of God, through Christ, as the psalm says, through Christ's sacrifice, as we say in the church. Mentally and spiritually, this can be freeing and reassuring. Go and sin no more. You have been set right with God. You are free to live in Christ, to so serve God in the way that God would want. You are born again. Jesus has paid the price. God has forgiven you and welcomes you. Um, some examples of this, uh, some further examples in our hymns. Uh, what wondrous love is this? The lyric goes like this. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down. When I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ set aside his crown for my soul. Or here's one, the old if you grew up in a, uh, a, a, a kind of a tent revival -y kind of spirit uh, of a church, you would maybe hear power in the blood. Would you be free from the burdens of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Power, power, wonderful working power in the blood of the Lamb. All right. You get the idea. The substitutionary the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The next one, again, systematized th thinking-wise, although these are all biblically based, it's called the moral influence understanding. That's the second main way of understanding salvation. Again, this was developed by a man, or particularly articulated by Archbishop Abelard in the 11th century. Some of the same 
uh, this view says that when we consider Jesus on the cross, we are seeing the deepest and fullest expression of what divine love looks like. And as Christ's followers, he is our example. If anyone wishes to be my disciple, they must be willing to pick up their cross and follow me, Jesus says. When you look at what Jesus did, what he taught, and most importantly, his willingness to die on the cross for the sake of truth and love, that is the pattern that we are called to follow, to be inspired by through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't just say a bunch of profound things. He lived them, he demonstrated them. And so when we see the suffering one on the cross, you are seeing what love looks like in the face of very broken, messed up world. Love enters into the world and it willingly sacrifices for the sake of truth and love. And that's what we are called to follow. So this is the idea that through Christ's life and through his death on the cross, we are morally and are, we, are, we are seeing the example of love and we are called to follow that. Philippians says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. John 13, 12, 15 says, after he had washed their feet and put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have set you an example that you should always do as I have done for you. Clearly, that's the moral influence, uh, understanding of Christ in the cross. So the problem with this could be that the moral example influence doesn't really address the, the, uh, the fundamental or ontological question of evil and salvation. It's a model for discipleship, but how does it affect the concerns regarding salvation? Is it a mere prescription for what we call works righteousness? That is the idea that we can somehow work our way into being right with God. To some, it seems too maybe touchy-feely, too squishy. It's sometimes called the subjectivist view of atonement. But the good news is we have about as real of a model for authentic faith and discipleship as one could possibly ask for. For God so loved the world, not to condemn the world, but to save it. Save it through loving sacrifice. Again, the scripture, no greater love can anyone have than to lay down their life for another. In hymns like, will you let me be your servant? Will you let me be your servant? Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. It's just like modeling Christ through our actions. Or when I survey the wondrous cross, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them through his blood. So there's some of the blood theology there too, but, but it is this idea of looking and seeing the suffering Christ on the cross that is deeply moving about what it means to be a human, what it means to be, what, what love looks like. It's willing to go to the cross. And finally, this, this last one is called the vic, victorious Christ. Christus victor is, uh, is the Latin uh, word uh, or phrase. Um, the victory of Christ. Um, in this uh, theory, uh, there was really actually, I was surprised, it was kind of more articulated and developed in the 1930s, which is, but, but it's clearly in the scriptures. This is the idea that by the cross and the resurrection that follows, the powers of evil have been destroyed and broken. 
Death is, no longer has the power to control and manipulate humanity to do evil, to be oppressed by evil. Oh, death, where is your sting, Paul wrote. Through the cross, the powers of evil have been held, that have held humanity in the chains of suffering, have been defeated. Resurrection is proof of that, but of course, resurrection first has to pass through the, the, uh, the doorway of suffering, crucifixion. The view of the cross has actually been, this view of the cross has actually been one in which liberation theology has drawn some inspiration. This includes black liberation theology and feminist theology. These theologies essentially operate on the premise that if the powers of evil, or Satan if you will, have been vanquished by Christ's death and resurrection, then the evils of oppression and of the marginalized specifically have been defeated at the cross. And we are to live as if, as if. First John 3, 8, the Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And Luke 10, 17, 20, it says, the, it, the disciples were, had been sent out to, uh, to uh, heal, and they come back, and the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. And he said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and all over the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And finally, Ephesians 6, 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on this evil day and having done anything to, to stand firm. So the problem, if Jesus has somehow defeated evil through the cross uh, by his death, how do we explain the continuing existence of evil in the world? And particularly the existence com continually committed by, uh, by Christians themselves. Where is this victory? This can lead us to a false triumphalism, right? The idea that somehow the death and resurrection of Jesus magically solves all evil. The devil has been vanquished. And clearly every day when we read or listen to the news, we are painfully aware that indeed evil, suffering, pain, cruelty are alive and well in the world. Where is the victory? I don't see it sometimes. If we believe that, here's the good news. If That was the problem. Here's the good news. <laughs> if we believe that evil doesn't get the last word in this life, at least in the larger eternal perspective, then we have hope. We get to participate in that great truth. And everything we do in this world for the sake of all that is holy and beautiful and loving and true is to participate in that victory Christ demonstrated on the cross. Not as much, yes, by his death, but by his resurrection. We are free from despair. Evil oppressions are defeated, cosmically speaking. God grants us to live into the spirit of that victory that was won on the cross and vindicated in the resurrection. In other words, love wins. The battles continue, but the war is won. We, are not, we not only participate in this great cosmic truth, we prove it is true when we align ourselves with all life-affirming and life-giving actions, words, and prayers. And in this theory of atonement, victorious Christ, more than any other of the two models I just described, the cro cross only makes sense in light of resurrection, where greater victory, as understood in the story of resurrection, there can be what, uh, what greater victory has understood in the story of the res resurrection can there be for showing that death has no power over God? Truth, beauty, and love. So that, that understanding of the cross gives us encouragement to go and live in confidence. Um, a hymn, another rousing one. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. 
He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. We didn't sing that in the Presbyterian church, but I've, I've heard that one before. Um, or uh, uh, the, the Easter. Easter is a lot of cr the victorious Christ comes out. Sing your glad voices in triumph on high, for Jesus hath risen and we shall not die. Vain were the terrors that gathered around him and short the dominion of grave, death and the grave. So there's many examples uh, in, in our hymns of all three of these different ideas, ways of understanding of the cross. And there are other, other sub understandings and, and other, many other ways to understand the cross, but mostly it's what it does for us, what, how it speaks to our hearts. What does it tell us about who we are as human beings? How does it enable you? If any symbol leads you to, to, uh, uh, to, feel, to feel diminished or less, it's not, it's not a correct reading of the symbol. If the symbol leads you to freedom, fulfillment, empowerment, and to go and serve the Lord, it is a powerful symbol. So depending on your reading of the cross, and I've tried to give you some sense of how it can perhaps be read in a way that's problematic and how it can be read in a way that's uh, liberating and redeeming. Um, I want to end uh, this. Um, when I was in seminary, and this is... This was fun. Uh, instead of writing a paper, uh, the, the professor asked us to, uh, to do a uh, visual of some kind to represent how we understand our, our faith, particularly our Christian faith. And so here's what I came up with. And it's this, this, uh, this sort of bureaucratic looking fellow. And he's saying, there will always be victims. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then, and then it, it opens up, and there's these images from the book, um, The Martyr's Mirror, which I have a copy of, and I, I'd like to let you look at it. It's thick, and it's just full of verbatims and stories of, of, of the, the 2,000 years of Christian martyrs and what they went through. So, and there are some uh, lithographs in that from the, I mean, it's published in like the 16th century. So there's lith lithographs of Christ being cru crucified and uh, various Protestants being burned at the stake and uh, so forth. And it gets, it gets right, and that the guy's face that it starts at the beginning is still there. And he says, we're only protecting legitimate interests. So, and then you open it beyond that, and there's uh, a rather, actually, kind of a stern-looking Jesus breaking into the world. And the, the, the incoming of the incarnate Christ, and then beyond that is this big cosmic picture of, the, of, the, uh, of a whale and, you know, a, uh, galaxy and stuff. So that's the large cosmic picture. So that was a summation in picture of how I tried to understand uh, my own faith and what Jesus means and how that relates to the cross. So I shared that with you and I conclude. Uh, so that, that's it. That's, um, I don't know, if it, was it a sermon or was it a Sunday school lesson? I'm not sure. But. <laughs> Anyway, um, think of these things. When we are singing these hymns, um, and, and we do react to some of these from the problematic components of them, particularly the sacrificial stuff and the blood stuff and all, but look at them more deeper. They do, they do speak to people in some really powerful ways and positive ways too.